First of all, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, take a moment to, of course, thank our special speaker, who Hannah will introduce in a moment, and also to everyone who joined us this afternoon, right before I began my class, the weekly class, which we learn about the chief rabbis, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, of blessed memories, 10 paths to God. Um, I received an email from a fellow, Limey, a fellow Brit in our community, uh, Michael Lynchick and his wife, uh, Lynn, who are members of our community for many years. And they had flown back to London because Michael's mother passed away. And I promised him that because she was such a remarkable person, we had the good fortune of knowing her, hearing her story. She was 94 years young, a Holocaust survivor, but really an amazing woman, amazing, brave person, always saw the bottle half full, life as a blessing. And um, I said that I would dedicate tonight to her memory, even though we lose, so to speak, another one, but we never lose. When you hear people's stories and you see the next generation, it really reverberates and stays close to us, each and every one of us. I dedicate this tonight to Margot, to Margaret Lynch, or blessed memory. I'd just like to take a moment to thank you all again for coming on and for Hannah, for being so persistent in making sure that not only um, this is remembered and recorded and spoken about, but you know, when you have a passion in life, something that speaks to you, something which is everything within your life, you follow through with it and nothing can stop you. I came home this Friday night, rather cold, rather tired. I said, let's have kiddish. The kids were home. Hannah says, Mendy, you gotta sit down. I gotta talk to you. I'm thinking, okay, what did I do now? It's Friday night, usually not in the principal's office on Friday night. So she says, no, no. He says, I want you to know that um, I want you to, I want to read to you this paragraph of this book that I'm reading. Now, my mother used to me, read me bedtime stories, remember the old nursery rhymes. But in my room, on my bedside table, there is a, three books over there. One is a Jewish book on the Rebbe's teaching, different, different uh, speakers on Torah, the second is a, something on politics, and the third is, of course, Liverpool. Maybe Liverpool's on top, my sport, my football club. Han on her side has 15 books, and every one of them is another survivor's story. And every 20 minutes, she says, Mindy, I've got to read you this one. You have to hear about this, as if she was there and lives it. And what's remarkable is that we have so many people, thankfully, who are alive and well and healthy and have so much to share, and wrote books about their life, and... You hear people who deny, God forbid, the Holocaust. When I was a child in England in the late 70s, I was already hearing about people who deny the Holocaust. And here we have people so much more than survivors. They're people who are the cornerstones of our, of our communities. They're the foundation. They're the thrivers of our community, alive and well, willing and able and capable and willing as, as traumatic as it may be for them, willing to share their stories. So to them, they get the special Yashakar, a special thank you. Tachanu has a passion for this and does this. In perpetuity, this, this will remain alive for all of us to hear and remember, not only for it never to happen again, but for us to be more committed to our humanity, to our Judaism, to our Israel, to, the, to our America, to the things that we are blessed to have that we possibly take for granted every day. And last and certainly not least, a very special thank you to, I see over here, the Kirschenbaum and the Glassell families, Alan and Stacey Kirschenbaum have been dear friends, and they wanted to do something in memory of their grandparents. Who were lost and i see alan's parents on here so they dedicated this lecture series for the show to know that we can all hear share the stories but remember and dedicate to keeping the flame of yiddishkeit the flame of these holy and beautiful souls the flame of a great a great man and his wife and family who are with us they should be gesund i want to wish you and conclude with a blessing that judge you should be gesund all the years that you were the judge i mean you sat there and you bettered the society better the community he did so to show that not only each person is unique and each person is a blessing from god but you showed us how each person has what to contribute no matter which environment and which society and i'm gonna i'm gonna conclude with this last thing which i wasn't planning to say but i just watched it 20 minutes ago and it just came into my mind one of my whatsapp groups from london there was a share on a bus that i took as a child called the 253 bus the red buses and there's a 253 that went from my school to my house. And on this bus route, and I, I could share it with you now, but I don't want to take away from what it is. You have this young middle-aged couple, Hasidic couple, and there's a man standing on the bus and he's swearing every profanity at them. 
get the bleep bleep out of here, go back to your country. This happened today. Go back to your country. And the people, this husband and wife, were dressed like Hasidim are saying, but this is our country. We were born in England. No, you're not one of us. Get us, get us, get back. And then the woman very bravely says to him, it's been recorded, she says, but in our country, we're telling us to go back, whether it's Israel or Europe, right? We have English people there and we treat them and we love them. Those were the words she used. We embrace them, we love them, they're human. And to no avail, no matter what, this man just says, get the hell out of here, you're not wanted. And I took that, which happened today, February, uh, February 8th in 2021, in a highly populated Jewish area. And I'm saying for people who says it couldn't happen again, that hate is there, that we don't have to just remember what happened, but we have to fight hate. We have to remember what they did and also reverse it, exactly what the judge and so many of us are doing here each and every day, that it's happening now. It happens in many regions of the world, not just to Jews. So it's our responsibility as human beings, and certainly as Jews who have endured so much over so many years, to remember that this is alive. And we have to bring that flame of love, the flame of acceptance, the flame of blessings and appreciation that we have in our life very much to the forefront. We have to thank Hashem God for all our blessings and thank Hashem for giving us these beautiful thrivers and community uh, foundations who are share with us their stories. So thank you to all of you for joining us. I look forward to hearing tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rabbi, so much. Um, first of all, thank you everybody who is on here tonight and all of those who are going to watch this afterwards when we share it on Facebook, we share the recording. We are all here for a very important reason. We are all going to be hearing from a, a live witness. And when we hear from a witness, we know that Ellie Wiesel said, when we hear from a witness, we become a witness. And Ellie Wiesel is actually um, the one who wrote the forward for this book. He wrote the forward for um, A Lucky Child. And um, we're, go we're going to ask Thomas actually in a minute, um, the relationship and the connection that you have with him. I do want to do just a little introduction. I wanna of course thank Thomas so much. This is the biggest honor. As I was saying, my little Kobe, my little eight-year-old who I look, at, I look at him when I read your story when you were eight and my heart as a mother, just the, the, the feeling that I have, how your mother went through that, how so many mothers went through that, seeing their little boy and everything that you experienced. I looked at it through the eyes of a mother of an eight-year-old child. Um, and he watched me read this story and I told him little, little snippets that were okay for him to hear. Um, and he says to me that I'm famous because I'm meeting you because he watches me <laughs> read this book. And yes, it is true that you are um, our, our, heroes and you are, are our link to our past and you are uh, here to, to tell us the stories of our people and to keep them alive. And, you know, not everybody was brave enough to put their story down. And some are just now beginning to write their stories and some are, are not here anymore to tell their stories. You write in here that you wish you could have asked your mother questions. You wrote this much later on in life. And, and actually, El Wazel, um, in his introduction, talks about that how the book may have been different back then and how you have learned so much in life. Um, uh, you know, the lessons that you've learned have actually um, um, affected how you wrote your book from a different perspective. Um, but the fact that you took your difficulties and you decided to make a difference for others who are, would be experiencing that and your whole life you uh, pursue justice for others and you went to other countries and I, I will hear from you actually telling us what you've done as a judge, as an international judge to make a difference and to make a change. We're here for that purpose. We're here to spread this information, to teach, to educate and to make changes. And that's why I went to Poland on the March of the Living. And that is why I do what I do. That is why I read these books. And that is why I find um, whoever I can to tell the story so that we can learn them, we can be witnesses, and we can make sure that this never happens again. Before we go on, I just wanted to thank you for this kind, very lovely introduction. And it's a great honor for me to be here today with you and your friends. It's a very special pleasure for me. 
Oh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. It wasn't easy to find you, by the way. I, I went <laughs> online and I found that you had spoken for a federation. I forget which one. And I reached out to them and then I left some messages and some emails and they got back to me and it was, it was a big ordeal. But I'm honored to have you here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, going to show a quick video introduction and then we will begin. Um, if you give me one second. Thank you. The title of the book is uh, A Lucky Child, and it goes back to well, now it's you. 1939, when my mother went with a friend to a fortune teller. And the fortune teller told her that things were going to be quite bad for us. But then she said, uh, you have a son, and the son will survive everything because he's a lucky child. When I asked about my experiences during the war, I would say I was lucky to get into Auschwitz, then it's the truth. When you arrived in Auschwitz, usually what happened was that children, sick people, old people, would immediately be taken to the gas chamber. I managed to get into the camp rather than end up in the gas chamber. And that's what I always mean when I say I was lucky to get into Auschwitz. We were separated, my mother and all the women on one side, all men to the other. I only glimpsed my mother during that entire period in Auschwitz once for maybe less than five minutes. When we arrived, after we went through the, the usual disinfection and when they cut your hair, the next thing they did was to tattoo you. Of course, every morning when I wash and shave, there is my, there's my number. And in many ways, it, it's sort of a reminder of, of my own obligation. Uh, to, to work for a world in which this doesn't happen anymore, that uh, especially the children don't have to experience what I experienced. Mm -hmm. I tried to write the book the way I remember the experiences as a, as a child. Whenever I taught my sons how to ride a bike, I would reflect back on my own experience of learning how to ride a bike. I became an errand boy for the German commandant. One of my jobs was to take the bicycles of the uh, SS uh, visitors that he had and take them to a bike stand. I couldn't sort of resist the temptation to ride the bike itself. And of course, I would fall a few times. And, uh, and at the same time, I was terribly scared because if, if these people saw that I was riding their bikes there, I would have probably gotten quite a beating. But in the process, I learned how to ride a bike. So the, the experience of riding a bike was more unusual. <laughs> Sure. than that of my children and many other children. I was liberated in the concentration camp of Sachsenhausen. I ended up eventually in a Jewish orphanage in Poland near, near Warsaw. At the same time, my mother in Germany and my uncle in the US were looking for me. And then a miracle really happened because a person in the Jewish agency in Israel or Palestine as it was then called, saw that there was a child on a list from coming from an orphanage that wanted to come to Palestine and the woman in Germany looking for her child and then and we matched the name. It, it was really a miracle. We were reunited at the end of December 1946. When I'm asked how was it when I was reunited with my mother, I cannot talk about it. It was one of the most difficult parts to write about in the book because tears would always come. And so I, I would have to stop when I was writing that part. And that's why I can't even talk about it. I am the American judge on the International Court of Justice. It's a court that settles disputes uh, between countries. It's the highest international uh, court uh, in existence. My experiences uh, in, in the camps equipped me to be a better human rights lawyer, you, you, have a, you have a sense for what it means to be a victim. And you also have a sense of whether the people that you're interviewing, for example, are telling you the truth. When we talk about the Holocaust, the usual thing that you hear about is that six million died. Th that really doesn't mean anything to people. It doesn't mean anything to me. It loses the human quality behind it, the individual people who died. And so 
I've, I've always felt that it was important that we write about what happened to families, to individual people, uh, what they did during the war, what they did in the camps. And only th that way will we be ever un able to understand the, the real human tragedy that the Holocaust was. So true. That's why we're here today to hear your individual story. And that's why I read one book at a time, each person's story, each human being. And with your story, there were so many, so many chances, so many times where by a split hair, your life was spared. As you know, your mom believed you were a lucky child. But how many of those children almost by a split hair again and again and again and then not anymore. And they're not here to tell the story. So Thomas, what we're going to do now is we're going to share um, a, a slideshow and we're going to go through different pictures that you're lucky to have. You'll tell us how you have those pictures of yourself as a child. And we'll go through different experiences, some that we have in the pictures and some that we do not. And we just want to hear from you. Okay, so um, the first thing that I'm gonna ask Thomas to share with us is, um, you can see Eli Weisel's name. This is the picture of his book, which I have right in front of me. Um, just the first thing, because you said something to me about Eli Weisel today, and I just wanted you to share how, um, you know, your relationship and connection and what Eli Weisel had told you. So if you can share that with us. Yes, well, uh, Eli Weisel, the way I really met him once, he said to me, you know, we were on the same death march out of Auschwitz. Uh, we, we didn't know each other at the time. And then we, we served together in the Holocaust Museum. Um, and uh, he was a very special person. And I think we, uh, what is so important, if it hadn't been for him, much would have been lost in terms of the memories of the survivors. Because by doing what he did, helping to establish the museum and recording, getting to record all of the, as many people as possible, their experiences. Um, he managed to save a, a treasure of experiences, uh, which will now will never be lost. It's, it's, uh, to me, he, he really made a contribution uh, that I don't think he himself realized how important it was. Wow. Thank you. Um, and he was a mensch, <laughs> a very special mensch. Yep, yep. And he definitely shared, uh, you know, I mean, the books that he wrote and taking the step to say how important it was that everybody that can shares. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how did he get to write the forward for your book? Um, you, I, I don't even know how it came about because uh, as the publisher said to me, you know who's going to write the preface to your book? And I said, I don't know. Wow. Apparently the publisher approached him and there it was. Wow. Thank so you. It was a very special thing to have that. Mm -hmm. Is it in the French edition? That it started or? No, no, in the. Always from the German one. It was in the German. Oh, yeah? First in the English edition. It's not even in the, in in the, the German, German or, or French edition. No. Mm -hmm. Because the book was first, believe it or not, the book was first published in Germany. American publishers were not really interested in it. Mm. Uh, wow. And when, when they saw that the book was doing very well in, in Germany and other places, then suddenly the American publishers were interested. Wow. Well, we have to continue to make sure that the books do really well. And that's one announcement that I'm gonna make now, actually. Uh, one of the reasons why you know we do this is also to introduce the authors and to introduce this writing. This book should be on e in every home and it should be accessible to everybody, and especially the youth that are ready to read it. 
because they need to be witnesses. They need to hear these stories. This is fascinating. It's a great read. And I have to say, I sat my husband down Friday night to listen to what he said before, but we were laughing together because Thomas, you have a real sense of humor and we're gonna hear a little bit of the funny stories that he shared in here. And it's a really interesting read. I'm on my third time reading it already. So Thomas, we have here some unbelievable treasures, pictures. Yeah. I'd like you to tell us what they are and why and how we have them. Well, I think the, the oldest picture here of the three is probably my father and my mother, well, probably one of the earliest pictures uh, of them. Probably just uh, uh, before you were born. Before I was born and, and probably, yes, uh, shortly after they, they met. Um, th this picture, incidentally, was taken in, in my father's hotel, in the, in the garden of his, of his hotel. And this must have been taken in Slovakia, as you can see from the, what we are wearing, it was very cold. Um, at roughly the same age almost. But I think the Slovakia picture is older than the one in, in the Wachnia, no? Mm, yeah. But I was a, I don't know how old, I must have been about a year and a half, two years old at the time. No, about four years, 38. Oh yeah, that was 38, yes. You were already on the move, yes. Yes, yes on the move, we're gonna hear about that in a minute, yeah. Yes. You wanna tell us how we have pictures of your family, how your pictures survived, and we can talk, we're going back, we're going, you know, right. but we can talk about that now, I think, because that's, it's, it's it's really wonderful because um, my grandparents had the, most of these pictures. Uh, they, my my parents were sending them pictures. And your father's uh, parents or your mother's parents? My mother's parents, and that's how these pictures survived. And as a matter of fact, they survived in in Göttingen, my mother's hometown because my grandmother gave all the pictures she had to the German neighbor. A big suitcase. In a suitcase, with a suitcase with a lot of other things uh, to preserve it. And when my mother came out of the camp, the first thing that woman did was, I have something very special for you and gave her the suitcase. Otherwise we wouldn't have had any of the pictures. So this was a, a very special gift that that German had made for us. She risked her life. She was worried that the Nazis were going to come and look for it and find it. She said. Yes, and that would have been she would have been very dangerous for her. Yeah. And she took it out. It was all full of dust. She she had a bakery there, and your mom went into the bakery. Didn't yes. even know she didn't even know she had it just by chance. She went in and she gave her a hug. The woman gave her a hug and said, I have something for you. Unbelievable. Yes. Okay. You'll have to forgive me. It's not all that easy for me to, to talk about some of these things. But these pictures I love. <laughs> yes, precious, beautiful picture. Your father, it's a yes. glorious picture. My, my, my father died three months before the end of the war. He was killed. So what is this place? This is, my, this is the back, I think, of my father's hotel and, and the garden. So can you tell us uh, about was, uh, My father worked in, my father was born in Poland. He worked in Germany. And uh, when Hitler came to power, he decided to leave Germany, went to Czechoslovakia and bought that hotel. Uh, in order basically to provide refuge for his friends in Germany, if, that they would have a place to come if they had to leave Germany. And that was really the history of the, of the hotel. The hotel still stands, and Peggy and I even visited it. We didn't stay in it, did we? We did, did stay, we stay there, in it? I'm sure. Yes. yes. The facade had changed, it was very communist. -y. Yeah. Oh, but yes. the room was exactly like that one in the picture. And the food was just as bad or good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I hear your mom didn't cook much until she had to. <laughs> then you figured out that she couldn't cook. But can you tell us about um, what came about that your parents didn't have the hotel anymore or how that happened? Well, what happened was that the Klinka Guard, which was a, a fascist Slovak organization, just confiscated the, the hotel. Uh, I think in 1938 or 37 at that point. And that's basically when my father decided to leave and, and moved us to Poland. Right. But the, the hotel still stands and um, yep. we, we, we just want to make sure to see it. I had planned uh, to give the hotel uh, to, to Lubochna <laughs> to be used as, as, a, as a human rights uh, institution. But it was too late because by that time it had been sold a number of times and it would have been very difficult to met it. But it's there and people know what it is. Um, at least uh, we made a big effort to make sure that the registry and every other institution would know what the origin of the hotel was and is. Yes, and you did that in your book. And just uh, reading about how your father who worked so hard and all of his money and all of his savings and everything went into here and they just kicked him out and said goodbye. You know, take your family and leave. This doesn't belong to you. And he had to leave without anything, without his, any money and without anything. It was all in there. And my mother's dowry <laughs> as well. So just that feeling of like everything being stripped and taken away from you and then you you have nothing and you just have to go and you know the, the thing was that we were always happy that we were still alive yeah. in all of those exercises right so and then you went to poland from there um and you share in your book about your your travels to poland um i guess we can get i don't know if we can get we'll get to that soon but you want to tell us what this is this is my grandparents' shoe store in Göttingen, Germany. Mm -hmm. my, my mother's parents, Silberkleid, uh, they had one of the, well, a shoe store, um, which uh, they were, they had to, to sell at, they, you can imagine at what price to somebody else who, who had it. The store was still there when, when we came back to Göttingen. Um, the owner eventually sold it. It's still, whenever I am in, in Göttingen and in Germany, we always walk by to see that it's still there. And in the old days, you could still see the Zilberglite under the paint. Wow. Uh, wow. That's gone now. Is this the area <laughs> that you went to to get the pictures? Is this the same town? Or? Uh, when you went back to the town where your grandmother was, is this where the neighbor was that had the, the pictures from your grandmother? Yes, yes exactly. So it was a store like this, bakery. Yes. yes, and the rest of the house was really, the first floor after the, the shoe store was a storage facility and the other stories were where they lived. Oh. Wow. And that still stood, Göttingen was not destroyed during the war, so it was all there. And it, you can imagine what it must have been for my mother to come back. Mm. Not easy. Okay. And that's my mother and my famous car. My little red car that I had to leave behind. Mm. Yeah. It's a beautiful picture that we have the memory of it here. Yes. That's my, my grandmother and my grandfather. As you can see, I, I have my grandmother's hair. <laughs> yeah. And face, you look exactly, I was the same. Yes, incredible. Uh, you, I never let me forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I was reading the book and I turned the page and I saw your grandmother, I was telling you before, and I just said, wow, amazing that you have this memory, that you have this photo, this treasure. Yes. That you're able to know who you look exactly like and yes. um, what can you tell us what memories do you have of your grandparents 
But I should tell you something that's very interesting and very rare. Mm -hmm. um, my grandparents were sent from Göttingen to the Warsaw ghetto. And my father managed to get them to the ghetto, to our ghetto in, in, uh, in Kielce. So I still managed to get to know my grandparents for at least a year before they ended up in Treblinka. You write, you write about that, and it's very beautiful how you write about them. That's why I wanted you to share. It was a treasure that you had, that you were able to spend that time with them there. You said you didn't know them well before they came there. You don't way, I could see them almost every day for a year, and it was very, very special. Yeah. You have to let me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those things are a little hard, so. I know. You know, they're hard. And, and I thank you for sharing them in the book, and I thank you for sharing them with us. Oh, no, I have to share it in, a, in their honor, too. In their honor. We will not forget. No, my, my grandmother was a very courageous woman who never let any Nazi on the street call her names. She would immediately reply. <laughs> wow. And Tough woman. My uncle would... would Tell her, don't do that. You might get into trouble. And she says, I'm not afraid. Well, you know what? You shared a few times in your book how your mother had chutzpah. Oh, and yes. she, oh, yes. she stood up to the soldiers, too. Oh, yeah. Um, your mom was called in to go to the soldiers, and she was once called in and almost arrested. But, you know, before we go to the map, it's a funny story um, how she was almost taken and what she did to get out of it. Do you want to tell how you, what your mom did when she was asked for a passport? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's chutzpah. Yes, that, is, that was chutzpah. Mm -hmm. my, my, there was, this was still in Czechoslovakia when we were, and they're deporting all foreign Jews from, uh, from Czechoslovakia. And uh, my, my mother came, was called, and my father was traveling at the time, so she and I were the only ones there, and they asked for a passport. And she handed that passport to the man, figuring that he didn't know how to read German. In fact, it was her driver's license. Mm -hmm. And he looked at it. He was very much impressed. Yeah. And and she actually, yeah, she, 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 she was actually asking for the supervisor. And she said, you're going to get in trouble because I'm really a German. Oh, so she oh yes. The German and she wanted to speak to the German consul. Can you imagine it? Yeah. But she really didn't have a passport. She says, I'm going to show you that I'm really a German. And she takes out her, her license instead yeah. of her passport and she shows it. So she gets away with it, but she really oh, took she, a risk. She would always get away with it. You know, she, she was about five foot tall. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, tremendous courage. Yes. Throughout, uh, well, now we see she got it from her mom. Yes. So that's nice to hear that. See, yes. I, no, I, she, I didn't hear that in the book. That's why I'm hearing it from you. This is important. No, she, and uh, she was, she kept the memory, and in Germany even, uh, in her own hometown, which was hard for her to come back, um, she relived some of the experiences of, of the grandparents and her experiences uh, of the Nazis, uh, and managed to deal with it very effectively. Can I can't imagine for anybody how that was. No, it wasn't easy. But you know, the problem was that in Göttingen she had a house. And otherwise there would there was no place for her to go. But she was able to go back there. She went back to Göttingen. Mm -hmm. And people of her friends from her high school would sometimes meet her on the street and they would say, Gerda, where have you been all these years? I haven't seen you for a while. That was sort of her, her first arrival. Wow. Why did they not know? Why would they say that? <laughs> well, you know, they, they knew a lot. Whether they knew special details, probably not. Um, but then they didn't want to know. You, in, in Göttingen, I, I went to 
then for two years in the, in the high school in Göttingen. They really didn't, uh, it was not something they wanted to know. Uh, you told me that the same thing when you came to Patterson, right? Then I went to a high school in Patterson, yes. You said that nobody asked and they didn't want no. to know. That was, that was the surprising thing, the Jewish kids. Uh, they just didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. Well, in part, you know, I felt that book had to be written uh, so that it would be there because uh, memories are short. Yeah. So Michael Bornstein, who's a survivor who spoke for us a couple of weeks ago, said the same thing. People didn't ask and didn't want to know afterwards. You don't want to talk about it. Yeah, that was the surprising thing when I came to the United States. I, I uh, stayed with my uncle and aunt, and they had a lot of friends. Nobody asked me a question yeah. about what it was like. It took a lot of years. People didn't want to hear about it. Uh, people had their own experiences, of course. They had come to the US in the late 30s, and uh, and I must say, I wasn't unhappy that I wasn't asked. You were one of three, one of three children to make it yeah. on, the, on the march, on the march of, you know, the death march. Um, and here, when I'm reading your book, I followed your march, you know, where you walked and how you walked and um, a lot of walking and a lot of a lot of also open car, open trains with a lot of snow in them. So very difficult. Each journey that you went through is very difficult. So this is a very important. For one reason. It, the, the reason was that this was my way. If I lived and survived it, I was defeating Hitler. And that stayed with me throughout that period of time. It was something that encouraged me as a, as a, as a child um, to make it. Uh -huh. And it always was there. If if I let them be, kill me, they would have won. So it was. So on the death march, when, when one was very tempted to sit down, uh, I didn't because of that. Unbelievable, ten-year-old child to think that way, and yeah. and to be have frostbite and to be walking freezing, tired, exhausted, hungry, but to just keep on going and say, "I'm not going to let them win." Yeah. Well, I have I st I have a memory from that period because some of my toes were amputated after that. So every time I change my socks, there they are. That's my my memory. And if that's all I lost, I lost very little. Yep. This is me as a soldier of the Polish army. <laughs> this, this was one of the few Jewish soldiers in, in the Polish company that uh, took me after I was liberated by Polish uh, troops from the concentration camp of Sachsenhausen. And he managed then to get me to a Jewish orphanage in, in Poland. Mm -hmm. And you have a little tailored suit here that they made just your size. I'm sorry. They they have you have a little tailored suit that they made just your oh, size. Yes, of course. Match there. A hat. <laughs> uniform. A uniform. Yes. Mascot. This was so, the mascot know, of the Polish army. The mascot. They, they gave me a gun, and um, which I, as a matter of fact, I, I told Peggy the other day, I know where I buried it in a tree near the orphanage. <laughs> Still there, probably rusting. Uh, no, but um, being a, a sort of with the Polish army as a mascot was a wonderful. After surviving that, all of that I survived. Suddenly, I had a pony, I had a gun, and it was a totally different, exciting life for me. Uh, Everything seemed for a while to be forgotten about the past. And he was one of the Jewish soldiers, uh, very few Jewish soldiers in that Polish company. But I was treated extremely well and fed and... Um, 
some of these things one doesn't expect. It, it was actually a, a lovely time for me to be to come out of a camp and suddenly find to be part of the Polish army. And this was the first Kosciuszko division of the Polish army. Tell us about the kids that get sort of that sort of experience. Regard. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. I can't imagine my little boy. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about the gun. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> the gun. What do I? What do I know about the gun? Who, who gave it to you, and what they? What you did with it? Yeah. Well, I, don't, I don't remember how I got the gun. Actually, do you? Did I write about it? I, yes. One of the soldiers gave it to you. Oh yes. And then he took you. And then he taught you how to shoot. Yeah, yes. Mm. And oh, then I, and you were shooting the porcelain. Yes, I was shooting the porcelain of the German electric. Um, mm -hmm. Electric poles. The electric poles were the porcelain. Which wire. doesn't exist anymore, no. I think. <laughs> I would just shoot them down, which was meant that they didn't have any light, which was great for me to be doing that. Yes. You felt like you can get back a little bit. Uh, the, the kind of joys that that a child has with that experience and then suddenly being in a different position uh, and having the Germans be afraid of this little kid uh, and being surprised that he spoke the German that they spoke. In addition to, I think what made life so much easier for me is that I spoke Polish and German. Uh, that helped immensely, uh, and I actually helped in the, the Polish army by speaking German and being able to translate. Mm -hmm. Your mom was German and your dad was Polish. Yeah. Okay. And when, when my father and I were together, we spoke Polish. When my mother and I were together, we spoke German. And when the three of us were together, we spoke German because my mother didn't speak any Polish. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So, they understood a lot. Uh. so, do you want to tell us what these papers are? Well, this is from. Uh, you remember what was the name of the, but these documents? The Pat Aronson. Pat Aronson. Um, but th this was. I don't know which that one is. I don't know what, what this one is. The, other the, one, one. the one with the scribbles. Well, this uh, this one, the one here. I want to start with this one. We can start reading a little bit about what the book says underneath it. It says this single piece of paper found among the million document files on deposit at Vod Arrelson traces the something of my father's suffering during the Holocaust. I believe this is a paper that says your father's name on it. Yes. 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 And all, all the inmates at that point had some a card like this, and this was the one about my father. When he went into Buchenwald. Yes, you can see that he that he ends up in Buchenwald, and he dies actually in Buchenwald. At the end of the war. At the end, three months before the end of the war. And is this paper also from there? I'm not sure what this one is. That's a, that, again, this, this is my father's name on it, yes, but. Isn't that pneumonia? So uh, Lunge. Lunge is and Lunge. Yeah. Yeah. It's here that they indicate that he. That was part of his death certificate. Yeah. 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 It said the diagnosis of his medical condition appears to have been prepared at the time of his admission to the infirmary. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he died of... Uh, yeah, and they actually had a, a complete report that he had double pneumonia and even mentioned the temperature in the, yes. in the death certificate. Yeah. I, I had a hard time believing it because, you know, the Germans would sometimes write up these stories. Um, and it, I made sure that what was on these cards actually tell the truth. Because oftentimes they would just make, write a story, somebody may have been executed before, right. and it still was there. So, 
this is a very special document. I've just seen the date, 15th of January, 45. 14th must have been when he was admitted. Yes. My father died, yes, he died on, in, January. in January of 45. Okay. So I want to just introduce the next few papers and then we'll have you talk about them. Um, to me, after reading the whole book and getting to the end and finding these papers was fascinating because in the book, Thomas, yeah. you talk about um, how first you had uh, said in the video before how your mother went to a fortune teller who said that you're going to be a lucky child and you're going to make it through everything. And, and your mother had seen you for a moment in Auschwitz through the gate before she uh, left to the women, a woman's camp, right? Yes. Um, and before the war was over. And she, when the war was over, she just believed that you were still alive. Now, that means that she believed, I mean, after the march, the death march, and after everything, she had no contact with you, but in her heart of hearts, she believed you were alive. Yes, and people would tell her, you know, he can't possibly be alive. All of the children died. And she said, I know he was alive. He is alive. And she never gave up searching for me. And she actually was misled at first. I'm going to go ahead a couple slides and then I'll come back to this one. She was misled because, where is that picture? Oh, I don't have it. Ooh, I thought I printed it. Sorry about that. It's missing. Um, oh, you know what? I took it on my phone and I was going to put it on the slideshow. It's in here. She was misled because there was a picture um, of a soldier walking across the street with a few oh, yes. In Berlin. I'm going to show it right over here. And actually, after getting to see your little face, I also thought that it looked so much like you. I'm sorry that I didn't blow this up on the slideshow, but your mom saw this picture and it was not you. And she traced this for a long time, believing that this was you and that you were alive and this was you. Yes, and that was very important for her that she believed it. Uh, and uh, a mother will see what she wants to say. <laughs> And believe what she wants to believe. She wants to the miracle was that her belief was actually correct. Yes. And so she pursued finding you. And, and she told, you know, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but she was told you can't possibly be alive. All the kids have, have been killed. And she said, I know he is alive. And for two years, she searched for me. She did. And now we have the documents. And I, in the book, there's small lettering. It was hard for me to read them. This is terrible. But hold on, somebody needs to be muted. Um, but here, in, this, in these documents on this, uh, you know, I was able to blow them up and we could read the words so clearly. And you can see the struggle and the pain and the excitement. And just, you can see this whole journey of a mother looking for a child and the people that were helping make this, um, actually happened that she they were able to find each other yeah I'm just trying to um, I'm just going to ask everyone to mute themselves if you're not muted just because I can't find every anybody who's not muted here um, so to, was, Thomas I, if you can tell us what is this this document here so th this document first is the first one uh, indicates that I was in the orphanage in Atlas the Jewish orphanage Northwest, which is a small town, a resort town, actually close to Warsaw. Um, and here the, the, uh, the next one. The, uh, Can I just read this? Is this, this is the first one? Because I try to do it by date, but I could be wrong. It was hard to read some of them. I just want to read some of the wording here. It says, um, this jury has been working for a year on a case for the above named Czech child and has recently succeeded in ascertaining his whereabouts. The child is in Poland at the Jewish orphanage in Otwok and can be contacted through the following authorities. And it says over here, the authorities, the poor mother is naturally so overcome with 
the good news that she can scarcely believe that her child has really been found at last and is anxious to receive concrete information from the orphanage. We would be most grateful if you could contact either the Jewish committee or the orphanage as quickly as possible and request them to advise us of the child's welfare, etc. It may also be, you yeah. may to request this, I have something blocking the top of the, ooh. okay, sorry, wait, wait. Um, Rabbi, you want to read the top line? B, you may to request them to tell the child as they deem best that his parents are alive as well. He is, however, only 12 years old, but it was considered probable that he was under the impression that they had been killed in Auschwitz. Five, if you could settle this as expeditiously as possible, Preferably by telegram, it would be much appreciated by this office. Six, awaiting an early reply from you, we offer our grateful thanks for your cooperation and assistance. S. Morant, uh, the Council Director of Bureau. Wow. Reading this, and I mean, when I was reading this and just reading this now, it's just we, we, we could feel that, you know, the the feeling of what it was, this little child is alone, this mother's been looking, the, the hope that the mother, how many, how many children didn't have this luck? How many children lived and their mother lived at another end of the world? I mean, I watch these videos of survivors who find, I just found a, a brother and sister who haven't seen each other and somebody did some kind of a genetic research and they just found that they have a sibling and they just now just recently, you know, got together again. This is just to read this and to feel the feeling of this. Oh yeah, no, it, it was, and you know, I didn't believe it for a while because the problem was that people were trying to adopt me. Yes. yes. You so were scared, I, the first I, letter. I, they were just telling this so that I would be taken to some place and be adopted. Right, so just to say a little bit on that is that you received a letter from your mother, but somebody else wrote it for her and sent it to the orphanage. And you looked at the letter and you threw it back and said, this is not from my mother. Because it's she had someone right. else, you didn't recognize the handwriting, but really it was from her. And eventually she wrote a letter herself. And when you saw it, you recognized the handwriting and you knew it was from exactly. her. You're, saying, you're telling that much better than I could. <laughs> we, we need to hear it from you though. But I, that, that was just. No, it's, it's very true. And you can imagine what it was like because I didn't believe it the first time. I thought there was, again, somebody who wanted to adopt me. And then when I received her letter, I, could, I recognized her handwriting, even though I couldn't read or write. So this is the American Joint Distribution Committee. They were extremely helpful to, to us both, um, especially after the war. Because, uh, the two years in, in Germany, they, they really the, helped immensely. A lot of survivors mentioned that they helped and I didn't know much about them, but I got very involved in the Federation here and, uh, you know, would hear about what they're doing today to help people around the world. And then when I started reading the survivor stories and saw that way back when they were helping so many survivors just to get back on their feet. Yeah. and to ha start having a normal life again it's just well you know what what was happening here something again um, somebody in israel palestine in those days uh, saw a mother looking for a, a child the search bureau and here i was in a polish orphanage planning to go to israel or palestine in those days and they put it together and notified my mother. All of these things that happened th during those first few years after the war. And if you were lucky that the, there were survivors, as in my case. My father, incidentally, died three months before the end of the war. I know, and you were with him for, you were with him in Auschwitz. Yes. You stayed with him. You were not separated from him. You were with him in the camp and in his barrack with him for a while. 
eventually you were separated from him, but you, when you first came in, you stayed with him and you spent time with him. Yes. So, but you know, to tell you again how these things are, he was sent out of Auschwitz to Sachsenhausen. And I was sent there three months later. And by that time, he had been sent to another camp. To Buchenwald. Uh, otherwise, to Buchenwald, where he died. Otherwise, we would have connected again. It's crazy. Okay. I think, I think he, he thought he, he, he should have helped me. He could have helped me. He thought he could have saved me. Uh, and I, I think once we were separated, I, I think he must have given up to... Because he didn't think that you were saved because when you were separated, that's a story we are going to tell soon, but when you were separated in Auschwitz, you were separated to go to... To the crematorium. The cremator to, yeah. And uh, miracles happened and you made it, but there was no way for him to know that. No, he didn't. So um, with further reference to your letter, as above, we have to... We have to do receive the following report from Warsaw office in reply to the cable sent to your at your request. We beg to notify you that the manager of the orphanage at Ottawak wrote us that Tommy Bergenthal was informed by cable of the location of his mother just before receipt of the JDC letter. Thomas Bergenthal lives in the children's home since 7 11, 1945. He was in a camp in Schaschenhausen. After the liberation, he was taken by the first division of the Polish army as a regiment's child and was brought by a soldier to us. He went through many hardships. Tommy, Tommy is a nice, pleasant, good and brave boy and is very liked by his teachers and colleagues. Simultaneously, his uncle from the USA takes an interest in Tommy. To his mother and uncle, Tommy will write himself, faithfully yours. Were you able to write? Yeah, I didn't really know how to write, but I... <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that letter. <laughs> um, okay. You can just imagine my mother, because everybody said I couldn't possibly be alive, and, and it was rare that somebody survived like I did. Oh, yeah. So many. One of three children to make it all the way through the march. Yes. You are determined. Well, um, yeah, you said you're not going to let them win. And look, you're here to tell that story. You're here to tell us. Yes. We're going to make sure they don't win. And we're going to keep telling your story and the story of your grandparents and the story of all, everything that you're sharing with us. No. And I'm only sorry that I lost my, the contact with my two friends. Yes. Uh, I, I told Peggy just the other day, I wonder whether they are still alive, because they went to, to Israel eventually. Well, you never know. Um, I can tell you that Michael Borenstein, who spoke to us, um, I'm not sure if he's on here because I can't see everybody. I did share the information with him, but he spoke to us two weeks ago um, and his daughter wrote his book, Survivors Club. Um, after she wrote the book, she, put, she has a picture of him holding up his sleeve. He was four years old with his number with a lot of other children. It's a famous little video. And after the book went out, two women, two little girls standing next to him saw the book. They're on the front cover and they're, they're living local. I think they're in New Jersey and they had a little reunion afterwards. Oh, isn't that so you never know writing this book and spreading this yeah. video and telling the story. And we are going to say their names in a minute because I have your friend's names in our outline that we're going to go through in a minute. Um, when you share the information, you never know what could happen. I followed me out of Poland, into Czechoslovakia, then to Germany where my mother lived. And it was quite a, quite a long trip actually, but it was all done actually by the joint. Yes. Yeah, they smuggled you over the border. Yes. Yeah, they had someone wait you at the border and they passed you from one place to another. And it says all that information in the book. It's all so easy. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, this is, is this the joint? Joint. Yes, this is the joint, yeah. Okay, Ari Tommy Bergenthal, age 12 years old, care of Jewish orphanage, full and subject transfer of above, name child to joint, 
His mother in British zone Germany, joint Warsaw, agrees to bring child to Czech border. These contact joint Warsaw about date of child's arrival at border stop joint stop at border stop joint base basic Belzen oh Belzen Belzen willing to pick up child in Prague please cable us immediately if you're agreeable to bring child to Prague and to keep it until rep to keep it until our representative AG uh, DC Belzen arrives so this was the the plan for the transfer of you and that was through the border of Prague right Yes, and, and this was a, uh, I, I then stayed in, in, uh, in Prague for a few days, I, almost a week, and was then smuggled for, out from Prague into the American zone of Germany and then the British zone where my mother lived. And that took a while. And I, of course, you can imagine my mother waiting at this point. Uh, but it all worked out beautifully. And, and pe people, really, if it hadn't been for the joint, this would never have worked. Right. Okay. Tommy was picked up. <laughs> I've never seen these documents. It's wonderful that you have them. So Tommy Bergenthal was picked up at the Polish Czech border and later sent to the transport of Jewish people to Munich. From Munich, the child was taken. So this is basically showing exactly how the journey went. Yes. So this is really amazing that it's shared. And oh, there's the happy reunion. And this is a little outline that we're not going to go through right now because we basically just discussed the, the story. This is a picture of you afterwards. But what I do want to get to, um, you could tell us about this. I do want to, I have an outline of the experiences that we missed out in the pictures, pick the ones we don't have pictures of. And I'm going to just have you go through the different um, scenarios that happen and tell us a little bit about those scenarios in the picture. But first, you could tell us this, you know, what this is. Uh, the, at least, I don't know where this picture was taken. Mm -hmm. but, uh, this is my mother, of course, and I. And this was taken in a resort in Germany, Bad Nauheim, where uh, I, I, I was reunited, actually, with my mother. Um, I don't know what more I can. This was at this point. She all, I think I had been. But this is fifty one. Fifty one. It was much later than. Yeah. But you were living there with her. Yes. And I actually left in 1951 to come to the United States. At the end of December of 51, I came to the U.S. And this is my uncle and aunt and two other relatives, my uncle and aunt and, and their little daughter, Gay, uh, who's, with whom I speak every almost every week at least. She lives in New Jersey. Um, and I stayed with them when I came to the U.S. Uh, for a year and a half in, in, in Patterson at the time. They lived in Patterson. And, and then I went on to, to college from there. Your uncle is which one? Um, my uncle is the one in the middle. And you and he was also looking for you. Yes. And this is his, his wife, Zenta. On the, on the, Zenta, on the right. And uh, the two people there are, are the uncle and, and aunt, actually. My, my aunt is the one who was related to me. Uh -huh. And Gay became my, my little sister. Right. Unfortunately, they are all gone except Gay and I. Can you share the memories? And Gay is uh, nine years younger than I am. So. Wow. It must have been special to, you didn't grow up with them, you didn't know them, but no. then all of a sudden you had family, blood, blood yes. relatives. Yes. And they, they suffered getting me through school and everything. And it wasn't easy for them because they weren't very well to do at all. Wow. My uncle worked in a, uh, as a, basically as a mechanic. And my aunt also worked and they did a tremendous amount for me. 
I'm sure they were very proud to see when you. Very special. The, this is the intro, the judges of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The court still exists today. It's now, we celebrated a few years ago, the 40th anniversary of the court. In, in, this is in Costa Rica. Um, and it's the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And these are the judges of different countries. Uh, and I was, uh, what was interesting, I was the only American ever to serve on this court because I, the United States never ratified the treaty. Um, but I was uh, selected by by a number of governments to sit on that court as well. And you and I, I think I am the youngest on this whole group. Wow. <laughs> but you were determined to be part of this. What, what made you want to be a part of this, uh, to do this with your life? Or what did you feel that you accomplished? Or can you tell us a little bit about the experience? Well, here I, I must say, I, I didn't at, at that moment sort of think of sitting on any court. It wasn't, but once I got on the court, I realized how important it could be in, in saving lives. And this is basically what the court was doing. And this was the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which still exists today in Costa Rica. And this is actually uh, the building that, uh, one of the judges and I selected for the court at the time when I was still in Costa Rica. And I met Peggy in Costa Rica, incidentally, also. So that's a very special place for me. Of course. Yeah. And, and not only that, Peggy was the interpreter on the, on the court. And she would whisper things to me, supposedly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's only <laughs> you, right? <laughs> I love it. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about just uh, the countries that you went to? And because uh, you did mention them in here. Like well, I think uh, I visited almost all of the countries that were part of the inter-American system. Uh, the furthest one was Argentina. It was to almost... Uh, uh, all of the countries in Central America and many of them in, in South America at, at one time or another while I was on the court uh, we visited and actually helped uh, people. The court was uh, quite important because it managed to protect a lot of people who would have otherwise not had any protection. And this, this gentleman here became was the Chief Justice of Costa Rica eventually and uh, this man became the president of, of, Hondur of uh, Honduras. Honduras yeah. mm -hmm. It's an interesting group of people. Uh, met on the right uh, was a representative of what was it? Colombia. Of Colombia in, in, at the UN. So the, yeah. and the, what, what Would you say would you say, Mac, uh, would you say that you um, that you saw atrocities in this country that reminded you of your experiences? I I didn't see them. I heard about them. Salvador, you saw. What? In Salvador, you saw. Yes, in Salvador, I saw uh, because and even there the Masote the, the Masote massacre. Uh, where it took place and the sole survivor told us what had happened there. Um, but otherwise it was just stories from survivors who reported to us uh, and uh, the courts uh, tried to help those people and find who was responsible for it. Okay. Uh, there, there was a, a certain justice when somebody who has been the victim of some of these violations suddenly becomes a judge and is able to uh, help people who actually were going through the same thing that he was suffering. Yeah, that's what I felt reading this and I, I, I guess we, we all feel 
and the court is still active and, and actually doing much more now than it was able to do when I was on the court because the first court was much harder to do things than they are able to do now. And Peggy was an interpreter on the court. That's how we met. You already said that. <laughs> I just want it's, to important. Sure. it's important <laughs> information. It, it more. We enjoy hearing it again, hearing it again, Peggy. It's a great story. It doesn't hurt. And I took that picture. Actually. Yeah. What when year what year was this taken? 20, uh, 2001, I think it was. Freezing. It was an anniversary of the death march. Yes, this you can show, see it what this was like on the desk. January in, in a Polish winter, it was, that's where, that's the time when everybody should go and visit Auschwitz. In the spring, it's full of flowers and grass and... So true. As, as bad. Yes. So true. I can't imagine. We went out in the snow and my feet, you know, I started feeling cold and I just was thinking about you, Thomas. I'm thinking, I just... There's no real shoes, you know. Yeah, but here, this was after the war already, warm clothes. Yes. When, when we came as refugees to Kelsey, uh, the ghetto, uh, we had very little. And by being a Shabbos guy, I managed to get all kinds of food for the family. And on, on Shabbos, I would be invited to the Shabbos meal and sometimes my parents and I got to know. And in those days, in the first in the ghetto, people were still living basically a, a relatively good life in, in the ghetto before, uh, once the ghetto was dissolved, the most people were sent to Treblinka, that was the end of it. But in the ghetto itself, especially in the first year, the ghetto lasted about two years, in the first year, people still lived in their regular where they used to live and on the whole people who had money could still uh, did quite well and if you were a Shabbos guy and they needed somebody with Shabbos to light the candles or start the fire burning I was the one and then I would be invited to to the dinner and that was a very special occasion hey they couldn't they couldn't bring anybody in at that point that was <laughs> You know, they in their old life, I guess they used to just bring, you know, people from the street, but that changed in the ghetto and yeah. Yeah, well the ghetto was, you know, in many ways quite ordinary initially. Now the firewood was things we used to steal from the poles who were driving through it. The tefillin, I, I was thinking the other day about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I told you about I told you I sat my husband down and we were laughing together. About that story. Right, put it under there. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. You want to tell us the story? It's a very funny story. Well, for some, there were two boys and I, and we found the tefillin. And one of them said, You know, first of all, if you put it under your armpit, you'll be able to fly. So we put it under and we waited, and nothing happened. It's <laughs> <laughs> really funny. So yeah. that. Uh, I enjoyed reading that. I was really laughing out loud. It's you know, in that sense, those things, looking back on them, were very funny. But at the time, this was That's funny. quite difficult, yes. It was difficult, but you were also children, and you acted like yes, children. We, we had a, yes, and the firewood, we would steal it from the poles driving by. We would jump on the back, and then the guy who was driving there would try to get us with his whip, and we had firewood. Um, mm -hmm. You did what you had to do. You were little kids, and you... yes, and it, it's strange, you know. I, I hadn't thought about this for a long time, but uh, the kind of things one does as a child uh, to survive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I saw I, my grandparents. I managed to still see them in the in the ghetto. Once again, Sarenka is very hard for me to talk about. Two uh, children, uh, children of, a, of friends of my mother who were being shipped to Treblinka and they s said to my mother, Gerda saved them. And the, she handed the children over to my mother. 
So I'm just going to say that Yusuf and Zarenka became like a little brother and a sister to Thomas. And, and you can imagine his mother took care of them. Until they were, they were taken from us. You describe that in the book, and I think it's very important for everybody to read that and to remember these children. And there's a monument now in that ghetto. Yes. In memory of them and all the other little children that were taken. So in the, in the in the ghetto, if anybody ever goes to Kensev, to, in, in the Jewish cemetery, there's a monument to all of the children, the 37 or, or more children who were killed in the, in the ghetto. The one from which I was the only one to survive. And two other children survived, your two friends, because they were hiding in the attic. They yes. took them and they put them in a house and two boys that you met up with in Auschwitz afterwards, which we're going to talk about soon, yes. um, who end up surviving at the end of the war with you, but then you separated. And that's who we're talking about. We're going to talk about them because we do want to mention their names just in case this ever gets out into the world. Um, so um, the, the, they separated the children from the parents, but miraculously, you had a little bit of, a lot of chutzpah, I should say. You <laughs> did something, you did something unbelievable. And I think about my little Kobe. You were my Kobe's, you were maybe, you were nine. Yeah. He's eight. You were just around his age. And you went up to that soldier who was pulling those children away from their parents. And you said something to him that saved your I, life. I that split it. Yes, I said to him in German, Herr Hauptmann, ich kann arbeiten and I can work. And he looked at me and he said, well, we'll see that and let me live. And I've often wondered what went through his mind. He was sorting the children out to be killed. And then he let one live. That's because I spoke German, I suppose. Uh. You're here to tell, and you're here to remind us, and you're yeah. here to make sure we never forget all of them, all of those children. Oh, no, I'm very grateful you're doing that because it is so easy to forget. You cannot forget, never. Yeah, no, no, it has to be remembered. It's painful. And, and it has to be remembered also because these things don't end. There's so many other occasions where things like that happen to also to our people still. Yeah. And as you've seen people in other countries and other places of the world. Yes. Then because you said that you can work to the soldier, you got a job. Can you tell us about that job? You were a little boy. The male. Oh, that I can I can work. And you, yeah, you became an errand boy. Can you tell us about that? Oh yes, I became I became an errand boy to the commandant of one of the camps in which we were, and it was I I would sit outside his office, to, and my father at that point I was still together with my father. And my father said to me, "Listen carefully to all the things he talks about and report to me." So I memorized a lot of the things reported to my father because I could hear everything that was being said. You can also hear the radio, right? And I could hear the radio reports and I would, my father wanted me to memorize everything I heard on the, it, that experience in memorization was very useful in law school. <laughs> yeah, well, what about the bicycle? Yes, I used, well, the, the bicycle, it, um, you you have all of these things down. The the bicycle, a number of occasions, but uh, my job was to take the bicycle of the SS visiting the commandant and putting it into the bicycle, uh, wherever it was, the storage facility. And that's how I learned to ride a bike. Um, of course, the the danger was I uh, was being warned if, if they see you doing this, you're going to get a terrible beating because every so often I would fall off their bikes. And I was like, but as a child, this was a great experience. I was excited to be able to learn how to ride a bike. 
That was what I was thinking about as a child, not what was happening around me. And then the, when I was the errand boy, I had a very special job. The, my commandant would go in and whenever he saw somebody not working, he would beat people terribly. Uh, so when he started walking, I would go ahead of him and I would go like this to people because he had a feather always in his head that he was coming. And so people were, nobody wanted to be, to be left uh, showing that he wasn't working. So suddenly everybody worked again. They knew that he was coming. So uh, these were some of the small jobs I had. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you, yeah, that's, uh, you saved a lot of people that way. It was a very smart thing to do for a little kid and very daring too. Um, okay, the next part, I don't know what you want to share if you want to share what happened, but this is what you witnessed as a little child. Well, and, and you mean about von Spiegel? Yeah, well, the hanging. Um, I don't know if you want to share about it or not, but there was the, the powerful point was the kissing of the hand. Yes, the, the hanging was uh, when we were still in, in the camp in, in, in Kelsen. Uh, some of the kids, uh, young people escaped and they were caught and they were brought in to be hanged, to be shown dying in, to us. So they were brought to us. We had to line up and watch them. And we had to, one, some of their friends had to actually participate in the hanging. And one of them, his friend was doing hanging him and he kissed his hand to make, just, can you imagine what it is like to help your friend being hanged? And by kissing his hand, he told him what he, what, helped the, the well I, I can't go on yes yes I mean it's you write in there very dramatically how I guess the same feeling that you had that we're going to win the Nazi I'm going to win the Nazis if I continue running the person who was being hanged actually turned to the person who was being forced to put the noose over his neck and took his hand and kissed it give him the courage and say it's okay Yes. Okay, I know you love me. I know that this is not coming from you and go ahead and do what you, you're being forced to do. And that was a very, very powerful and horrific yes. moment at the same time. Yes. That you witnessed as a little, little boy. Spiegel was a, a German Jew who in the camp when we were in, 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 the, in Kelsen before we went to Auschwitz, he had become a supervisor and really mistreated a lot of people on behalf of the Germans. When he came to Auschwitz, uh, the first night when we were in our barrack, uh, some of the people who he had sent to Auschwitz before came and beat him tremendously. And he begged to be allowed to go against the wire, the electric wires, uh, and uh, died on the wires. That was the so the first experience of my first night in, in Auschwitz. Yeah. Um, Everybody can imagine what it must have been like to see that and to go through it. As a little kid also. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's for me, like one of the hardest things is understanding the, I mean, people having to save themselves, but to, at other people's expense is very, very hard for me to understand that. But it was a very difficult time for people. So. Well, people begin, everybody is out to save his own life, but uh, some people were helpful. Yeah. Shared even small portions of bread and and others stole them from you. So you had both. 
anything you want to share about your father or your attempt to escape? You were separated to be sent to the gas chamber. So I don't know if you want to tell. Um, well, how... I should talk about my father because uh, my father knew the Germans extremely well. And he usually could predict what was going to happen. Um, and it, well, I, I think what what little courage I had after in the camps was uh, seeing the courage my father displayed. It was he was extremely courageous. Never his thing was never show them that you were afraid of them. Was was his when you have to be stand in front of a German. Look him straight in the eyes. Don't let him think that you're afraid of him. All of those things. Uh, well, I tell you, it's a little hard for me to go into all of this right now. What about just one thing? What smart thing did your father do to protect you when they came for the selection? They would come to I'm do. Sorry? What's what? Your father did something very smart to to prevent you from being, being taken when they came, when Mengele came for the selections, you know? Oh, yes. He, my, my father uh, had me stand at the back. We had to line up before the selection. And then Mengele, the, the doctor, German doctor who would be selecting people out for the, for the gas chamber would come through and pick them out and would send old people, sick people, children would end up in the crematorium. And he uh, would, uh, so my father taught me to stand at the back of the, I think that's what you yeah. want me to talk about. My father had me stand very close to the, to the barrack at the end of the, because we had to all line up in, in rows and as soon as the selections, after the counting, they would always count first to make sure they had everybody. And then the selection would start. And so I would be, my father taught me to stand right very close to the exit. And as soon as the counting started, disappear into the barrack and not be seen. And that wasn't always easy because they had dogs and everything else, but uh, I was never caught. And then eventually there is a separation from your father and you are put in a room and you do something very daring and very smart um, with the wire on the door. Well, we're separated and my father, and this is a, a very difficult story for me to tell because my father at that moment thinks that I am not surviving because he's being sent to work and I'm being sent to the crematorium. And I managed not to end up in the crematorium. So he goes to his death, I'm sure, believing that he wasn't able to save me from this and uh, assumed that I, that I died. So it, it was not enough to go through all of this, but to also have this terrible emotion that comes with the, with the pain uh, of what happened to people in the camp, the experiences. It's not even easy for me to talk about it because it's, uh, the older I get, the more I understand what it must have been like. Yeah. Well, we appreciate that you're talking about it because I can't imagine how difficult and bringing back those yeah. memories we want to keep those memories. We want to remember your father. Uh, yes. We want to remember. We have well, those I wrote the book because I thought it was important. Thank you. But one can never write a book and tell everything. Yeah. Um, so I think it's getting late. So we're just going to go quickly to just the, there's a lot more here as you see. But uh, 
I am going to encourage everybody to buy the book after this and they can read the stories. But if you can just tell us about Michael and Yannick, is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Okay, so tell us about them and your experiences with them and that how, you know, and then uh, just anything else that comes to mind that you want to tell about um, the rest of the story. Um, yeah, and then we'll just... Michael and Yannick were the two boys with whom I went, was together on the death march. And uh, they were slightly older than I was and they actually... As, helped me survive because they, they wouldn't let me, they, they would support me as we were marching in that terrible snow and, and wouldn't let me sit down and would take care of me even though they were just probably no more than a year or two years older than I was. Um, they came from I, I understand that they, they came from Kiel, mm -hmm. so they came, they came, they were the ones that were hiding in the attic and they- Yes, they, they were the ones. They were, they came from the you same. That story. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, <laughs> I said you know the story better than I remember it now. I'm just no, bringing, no, you know, true. but it was an important point that they were actually separated with, you know, when when you said in that time they were taken and they were put into a house, but they hid in the attic. They ended up with you in Auschwitz. They ended up doing the yes. garbage job with you, collecting the garbage. You speak about that. And then they ended up on the march with you all the way through to the end. And at the end of the war is yes. when you get separated. We were separated because I, I ended up in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, the infirmary. And I never saw them afterwards because, I, because of my amputation of my toes. And they were shipped out. I assume and I understood that they actually ended up in Israel eventually. Yeah. Well, I like to search for people that survived. I will look out for these two boys and see if I could find anything. And anybody else watching this who could help us find two boys, Michael and Yannick, yes. survived the march um, with a boy named Thomas. If there's anything that we can find out, I'm sure Thomas would appreciate it. She's gone through a lot with me, <laughs> with all of the experiences. Look, there's one of my favorite pictures with my car, my mother, and my famous car that I have lost and dreamed about when I was still in the camp. That was the worst experience. First walking three days in that cold without really the right clothes or anything. Anybody who sat down was immediately shot and body was pushed into the ditch. So the walk was usually 10 hours a day. And that I lost some toes in the process and everything else. The one that I remember was uh, to, to have to watch a hanging of people who had escaped and brought back and hanged one of our people having to put the noose over the person's head and it stayed with me and i was i think seven or eight years old at the time this was uh, my uncle and aunt who actually with whom I lived when I came to the United States. And this is the, the judges of the American Court of Human Law. Or on evil. Under certain circumstances, genocides can take place in many, in many of our own countries. That is why we must always be on the alert against this crime. Remembrance programs are so important by honoring the memory of the victims of the Holocaust, we commit ourselves to never again allow any human being to become the victim of genocide in any part of the world. Let me thank you particularly for doing this and uh, helping me really uh, tell the story, a uh, story that needs to be told. And 
you made it happen, for which I am very grateful. Well, um, it's a really an honor for me yeah. to be able to do this. An honor that I found, an honor, an honor to have you here. And it's important for people to hear your story, but your story also tells the story of millions, our people, our past, our history, yeah. and we need to keep that alive. And that's what we're here for. So if anybody here has questions for Thomas, I'm gonna open the floor. You can unmute yourself. Uh, would, would, did he participate in Spielberg's uh, recordings of his experiences in the Holocaust? Good question. Thomas, did, did Steven Spielberg manage to have a, an interview with you or a video of you? No. Well, I was interviewed by somebody from his okay. uh, group. Okay. Um, but I, I must say they, that I've heard a lot of good things about those interviews. Mine was not particularly... Uh, the person interviewing me wanted to know uh, what life we lived before the war rather than what happened in the camp. So I, I don't have very favorable memory of that interview. I did have one question. What happened to your mother when you came to America? My mother always thought she would have to work in a factory when she came to the United States. So she did, did not come did not come with me. Oh, and I came only for one year. Okay. And uh, never really went back, but my I would be my mother would come to the United States when I was here, usually twice a year. Okay. And she got to know her grandchildren, and uh, but she was always uh, she had this notion that if she came to America, she would have to work in a factory. I think I mentioned that before. Uh, she she had a, she lived a very good life if. Uh, after the war, and f f she left Germany and she lived in Italy for many years. She remarried, and then her, unfortunately her husband died. But um, I, I think, in many ways, in retrospect, I think it was better she didn't come to the United States. She had a much easier life than she could have had. She had a much easier life in Europe than she could have had here, at a time when I was not really in a position to do much for her. And, by the time I could, it was too late. Thank you. Thank you. We see each other at least twice a year, usually. Thank you. I actually just want to thank one person who's on here, um, my friend Talia, who's on here, and she actually introduced me to your book, and she went with me on the trip on the March of Poland. So I just want to thank her for being on here, and I want to thank her for introducing me. Uh, sending me a picture of your story because that really inspired this whole evening today and us to get to know each other. So thank you. Um, and Rena, go ahead. You had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to say hi to my friend Rena from uh, we yeah from when we were little kids in England. Uh, but it's so nice to see your face on here. And thank you for joining us. Hi. Thank you so much for allowing me to join in. Um, I think I've used up my box of tissues tonight. Um, your story has moved me as a grandchild of survivors and some who didn't survive. Um, hearing your story and thinking about my own grandparents, it's, I'm, I'm extremely moved. And I wanna thank you for sharing, for sharing your story. And Shandwar, if you could share a link how we can get the book, I would really appreciate that. Okay, I just went on Amazon and I put in a lucky child and Amazon has a lot of survivor stories now and I just keep on searching and keep piling up, um, especially the ones that are coming out later on because then I know that there's a chance that I can get to meet them. To come back about the book, the, the book has now been published in 16 different countries, including China and Japan. And I've often wondered, I've never really received a report of what the reaction was to the book in, in, in those countries. But it's, uh, it's been published in all, all of those different languages. Thank you for sharing your story. So thank you. Thank you, Rena. 
Thank you, Rena, for sharing, because it just shows us why this is so important to continue to do. And the, let me also say something to you here and to the group that you had. And it means a great deal to me to see that there's so many people still interested uh, in what happened to us. And uh, that's very, very important to those of us who've survived. Yep, it happened to us. It happened to our family and it happened to our people. Yes. And that's why we need, we need to all be interested and we need to all remember. Yes, Jillian. Hi, first of all, thank you. That was unbelievable. And I, I'm so touched and honored by your courage and your story and your bravery to share it with us. So thank you. Um, I also wanted to say that I'm certainly going to buy the book. I have four children and I absolutely want each of them to read it. But I also think in addition to buying one book, if we can buy two, or even if people just buy one and after you read it to make sure that you share it and maybe some great places to donate one or give one the, the local library where you live, any of the schools, particularly the social studies supervisors, because this is supposed to be taught in the schools, it's mandated. But sadly, because it's so difficult to teach, it doesn't always happen or it doesn't happen effectively. And the only way it's going to be kept alive is if we push for this and we make it happen. So like I said, if people buy this book, please also think about buying two or donate the one after you read it to different institutions so that other people can read it and it pays forward. Thank you. Jillian, while you're on, can you tell us a little bit about who your aunt is? Because I just spoke about uh, her before without announcing that it's your aunt. Okay, so my aunt is Sarah Ludwig and she's the little girl next to Michael Borstein who's shown with the little kerchief on her head, showing her arm also with the uh, tattoo from Auschwitz. She was the only, she was one of two children who survived her town in Poland. And it's absolutely a miracle that she survived, but the story that Michael tells and the cover of the book shows my aunt, Michael, and another child who remarkably all survived and never knew that they all lived in New Jersey one town away until a few years ago. And I was present when? at Michael's house when his daughter came and NBC did a story. And it was truly just unbelievable seeing them all meet for the first time since they were in that camp and that they all survived and mm. were living right by each other all these years. Oh, God. Yeah. So yeah, we watched the video of that. I didn't realize you were right there. Uh, but we watched that with, uh, and it would be nice to have some more reunions, so. Yes. We have to find your friends if they still, God willing, are alive. That will be amazing in Israel. Yeah. Well, this is one of the problems that, that uh, so many people, survivors, have already died. So. Yes. But even if their children are alive, or, you know, it'd be nice mm -hmm. for you to connect with them. What is what is so interesting now, and I'm sure that other survivors have to, had the same experience. I've heard my sons uh, hold, talk about my experience in different places, and it's wonderful to see how they convey the story. And Absolutely. they see it as an obligation that they have uh, to talk about it. And yeah. Thomas, Thomas, Thomas live sending now. you love and kisses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so You're much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you who joined. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 So good to see you, Irina. Bye. 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 Thank, you. Thank you for sharing also. Thank you so much. Ricky, nice to see you. I didn't say hi. Thank you for joining us. Thomas, what town do you mind me asking where you live? Are you in Maryland or Virginia? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Do you live in Maryland or Virginia? I, I live in Maryland, in, in Chevy Chase. Okay. Very close to, to the DC line. Yes, yes, thank you. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I Thomas, just... we wish we could hug you. <laughs> We're sending you hugs through Zoom, if that's okay. 
thank you so much. And it's, it's so wonderful to see that you're interested. And that means to me really that the stories are not going to be allowed to die. No. It's very important. 